Probability kernels and regular conditional distributions are going to play an important role in what we do for the next many lectures. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to briefly review their important properties right now. I'm also going to change the notation that we use for them. Earlier we referred to probability kernels with capital Q and the associated integral operators for them with a capital L. We're now going to use lower Q to denote a probability kernel and capital Q to denote the integral operator associated to it. We're also going to stop using the unfortunate choice before of the word generator, which actually means something else as we'll see in the future, and instead refer to those integral operators as Markov operators or Markov transition operators. We'll get there. Let's just go through the basics one more time. A probability kernel over two measure spaces is a function of the variable of the first space and events in the second space, taking values in the unit interval, with the property that for each fixed s in the first state space, q of x dot is a probability measure on the second state space. And for each fixed event in the second sigma field, q of dot b is a measurable function of the first state space. Now a typical kind of example that will come up most of the time and what we do, at least in the continuous time processes, is when this probability kernel q of x and b takes the form integral over b of some function, which will also denote lowercase q of x and y, nu of dy, where nu is some probability measure on the second state space. In that case, the condition is that this should be a probability density in y for each fixed x and should be a measurable function of both variables. More generally, q of x dot may not have a density with respect to some measure, and so we refer to it as q of x and dy. We showed that if f is a function on the two variable state space, taking, say, complex values that is either bounded or, in the real valued case, non negative, then if we integrate out the y variable, against the probability kernel of the function f, we get a function of x that is measurable with respect to the sigma field b2 on the second state space. Now, probability kernels give us a general way to talk about conditional distributions of random variables with respect to other random variables. If we have two random variables, x and y, on the same measurable space, taking values in two state spaces, then a regular conditional distribution of y given x is a probability kernel, which will denote q of y given x, with the property that if I take the conditional probability of the event that y is in b, given x, which is a random variable, I can compute that random variable by taking the probability kernel q at b and evaluating not at the point x, but at the random point x. We saw that these always exist if the state spaces are nice enough, for example, if they are regular Borel spaces. And as you showed on your homework, we can also boost this property to a jazzed up pullout product rule for these, which says that if f is a function of both variables, then the conditional expectation of f at x and y, given x, can be computed by integrating over the second state space the function f at little x and little y against that regular conditional distribution probability kernel q of x and dy, which gives us a function of x that we can then evaluate at little x is the random variable capital X. Now here are some special cases that encompass most of what will come up in our calculations. If the two random variables x and y are independent, we would hope that the regular conditional distribution of y given x shouldn't depend on x, and that is in fact what happens. If x and y are independent, then the regular conditional distribution of y given x is just the law of y for each fixed x. In other words, the probability that y is in b given x doesn't depend on x, and this random variable is actually almost surely equal to the constant, the probability that y is in b. And together with the product rule here, that means that in this case, the conditional expectation of f at x, y given x is just the expectation of f at constant x and y, which gives us a function of little x, evaluated 
at little x is equal to the random variable x, but only in this case that x and y are independent. That is not true if there's any dependence between x and y. In general, it might be kind of hard to describe the regular conditional distribution of two random variables, but there are two cases where we can more or less explicitly describe it. First, suppose that our two state spaces are imbued with two sigma finite measures, nu1 and nu2. Here we're usually thinking of Euclidean space equipped with Lebesgue measure. And suppose that with respect to those measures, the random vector xy has a joint density, that is with respect to the product measure nu1 times nu2. Then we can always express the regular conditional distribution as the kind of probability kernel with a density that we saw on the last slide. And that density is called the conditional density of y given x. And it has a simple form. It's basically the ratio of the joint density of x and y to the marginal density of x, where that marginal density in the denominator is what we get when we integrate out the y variable from the joint density. This is a problematic formula when the denominator is zero, and so really what we have to do is multiply by the indicator that the denominator is positive, and we get the fully correct answer in that case. So that's one special case where we can compute the regular conditional distribution. And another is if the two state spaces are both discrete countable spaces, where their sigma fields B1 and B2 are the full sigma field of all subsets. In that case, the regular conditional distribution of Y given X is just the probability kernel, which at X and B returns this sum here. In other words, as we should expect in this discrete case, it's good enough to compute this when b is a singleton point y, in which case this is just the probability that y is equal to little y, given that x is equal to little x. Now, a good way to deal with probability kernels in general is to view them dually in terms of the integral operators that they induce. So given a probability kernel, there is an associated integral operator. That operator takes functions that are bounded on the second state space and returns functions that are bounded on the first state space. And it's just defined by, for any such function f on the second state space, qf at x is the integral of f at y against q of x and dy. We formerly called these Markov generators, but that's not really accurate. As we'll see a little bit later on, Markov generators are a kind of derivative of these operators. Rather, this is the Markov transition operator, and we'll understand why we call that in the next couple of lectures. Now, it follows pretty easily from the properties of probability kernels that this operator does indeed map bounded functions to bounded functions. The supremum norm of QF is less than or equal to the supremum norm of F. And so indeed, this operator is a contraction from this space to this space equipped with their supremum norms. In fact, we have more properties that characterize these operators, at least in the case where we have the same state space for both variables. Any such transition operator associated to a probability kernel satisfies these four properties, and any operator that satisfies these four properties, that it's a linear operator on the bounded functions, it maps one to one, it preserves positivity of functions, and it is continuous under bounded convergence, any one of those operators Q is actually the Markov transition operator of some unique probability kernel. And we can recover that probability kernel just by applying the operator to the indicator function of a set B. That gives us a new function of X. And so Q of X and B is that expression right there. And moreover, if we now integrate a function against that probability kernel that we just generated, we will recover the same operator QF at x. One advantage of representing probability kernels in terms of their Markov transition operators is it's easy to compose them. If I have two operators q operating on the bounded functions on a state space, it's easy to compose them and I get a new linear operator which you can easily verify satisfies all these properties. Therefore, by the correspondence, it is the transition operator of a unique probability kernel and we can write down easily what that probability kernel is. The composition of q1 and q2 acts on f by integrating f of z against this probability kernel here. We integrate out the y variable of q1 of x dy times q2 of y 
dz, and that gives us a probability kernel in x and dz. Of course, from this formula, we see that we could actually integrate a function of f at x and z here if we wanted, and we'll do that in a moment. But first, let's talk more generally about taking products of probability kernels and measures. If q is a probability kernel, perhaps on two separate state spaces, and nu is a probability measure on the first state space, then I can take the product of nu and q, giving a probability measure on the product space. And it's just defined the same way we would define product measure, but holding x fixed like this. We take the indicator of the product set and integrate it against the probability kernel and then integrate that against the measure in an iterated integral, like our Tonelli definition of product measure. Then we have, as usual, if we want to integrate a function against this product measure, we do so as an iterated integral. We integrate out the dx variable against the measure nu of the integral of f at xy q of x dy. One nice feature that we will use shortly is that this is a kind of invertible operation. That is to say, if I have two probability kernels and I get the same measure when I take their product with some fixed measure nu, then actually they were the same probability kernel, at least almost everywhere with respect to that measure. Now that's true only if the sigma fields B1 and B2 are countably generated. That's certainly true for Borel sigma fields over RD, where we will largely be working. More generally, we'd like to take the product of a bunch of probability kernels, Q1 through Qn. We're going to restrict to the case where they're over the same state space repeated twice. And we can do so by iterating what we did, taking the composition of their transition kernels. That is, we take Q1 of x0 and dx1 and integrate that out against Q2 of x1 and dx2. That gives us a probability kernel in x0 and x2. And I can just iterate that and repeat, taking the product, which will get me a probability kernel in x0 and dxn, the last variable. Now, if I want to measure, I can then integrate that out against a measure in that first variable, x0, and that will give me a measure. As I did in the composition, I could think of it as a measure in just the xn variable, but in fact, I can now use this formula to integrate a function of all the variables x0 through xn. And so in fact, this defines a measure on n plus one copies of the state space. And to understand this measure, it suffices to integrate tensor product functions, as we know from Dinkin's multiplicative systems theorem. And in that context, there's a nice functional way to write down what these integrals are, integrating this function here, this formula here, in the case where f is a tensor product function, just means you iterate the following. You take the last function and apply the nth transition operator to it, then take that and multiply it by the next function and apply the n minus one transition kernel to that and so on down the line, multiplying by function, applying transition kernel, multiplying by function, applying transition kernel, and then in the end, take the expectation with respect to the base measure new that you're integrating against. We will see shortly that these kind of iterated operations are really exactly the way that we compute the finite dimensional distributions of any Markov process.